it's quite an honor. Uh, besides writing books, he is, uh, the articles that he's written and the abstracts he's written number in the hundreds. And so it's, it's just wonderful to have you with us. Uh, by now, most of us are familiar with the geology of Oregon, enough to know that the Bazoo floods scoured through eastern Washington, down the Columbia River, and into the Willamette Valley. And, um, and you'll be pleased to know that Dr. Baker had a part in that. He contributed a great deal to the quantitative research that was done that turned that ultimately led to the acceptance of this hypothesis that was outrageous when it was proposed and resisted. So, um, and not stopping his efforts there, Dr. Baker has also researched great floods in other parts of this planet and even on Mars. So, um, really, it's really wonderful to have you and everybody join me in a welcoming and giving a warm welcome to Dr. Rick Baker. So I'm gonna, yeah. Okay, take it away. Well, well thank you very much. Uh, certainly, uh, it's a, a little bit awkward being here because of the difficulties that you're all facing with the fires. Um, uh, we watch it with apprehension in the news. Uh, we're in Oregon all during the summer uh, because my uh, son and his family live in Portland and uh, we have our uh, summer residence there. Uh, but of course now I'm back at University of Arizona teaching. So I wish you all well in regard to the current uh, situation. So I'm, I'm going to talk about the controversy uh, that involved uh, J. Harlan Bretz. Uh, there's a degree to which it involves me because I have been, I have had an interest in the Channel Scabland region for over 60 years, but that's another story. Uh, I lived in the Northwestern US when I was in junior high and grade school and high school. And so I got to know the region. Uh, I'm in Arizona now, but I work uh, all over the world. So I'm going to now switch to sharing the screen and I'm going to, let's see, try to get to my, let me see, let me see if I can get, uh, uh, okay, I need to, um, okay. Can you hear me? Uh, we can he I can hear you and I can see your screen. Okay. You're not in presentation mode yet, but. Yes, okay, is that it? Yes. Okay, <clears throat> so here's the uh, title slide. And of course, it's a artist rendition of the Columbia River Gorge. Um, it doesn't have the human artifacts on it, but it shows the, uh, a depiction of the Missoula flood water uh, coming through about 16,000 years ago. I'm going to talk about this individual, J. Harlan Bretz, but I'm also going to talk about philosophical issues. Philosophy is trying to think about the things that we take for granted when we go about doing something. And so, we're talking about the science of giant floods. And what we take for granted are, are the assumptions that we make and how we approach a problem. So this gentleman, J. Harlan Bretz, his first name was J, just J. Uh, there's a bit of a mystery connected with that but we'll come back to that in a little bit. <clears throat> he was born in 1882. Uh, he, his uh, family was very devout and Methodist, but he became an atheist later in life, rather uh, vehemently so. Uh, he originally was going to be a missionary and he attended Albion College in Michigan. Uh, he, after college, he initially taught biology 
uh, in Michigan. But his wife uh, that he married in 1906, they had a honeymoon in Seattle. They loved the place and he wound up teaching high school in Seattle for four years. But he became interested in geology, we'll talk about that. Uh, and ultimately did his PhD research at University of Chicago. His first academic position after uh, his PhD was at University of Washington, where he lasted one year, and I like to tell the story to my friends at University of Washington, he didn't think much of his colleagues because he didn't think they were up to the science. And he left to go back to Chicago, actually for an inferior position. This is a picture of his biology class at Albion College around 1904. <clears throat> Bretz is the person at the far right leaning over. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, his uh, biology professor, uh, Bretz, uh, uh, credited with interesting getting him interested in science. He was particularly interested in snakes and frogs because of the impression that those had on the ladies in the class. Uh, Barr thought that Bretz would make a geologist, but uh, Bretz himself told me that what he really wanted to do was be an astronomer. And he, he had built his own telescope. He was fascinated with astronomy. So when he got uh, to Albion, he took an astronomy class and he made a discovery there that shocked him that astronomy was a lot about mathematics. And he said, this is what he told me, and you have to understand Brett's for his stories. He said, when he saw that, he realized that he had fallen out of bed when he was small and hit the side of his head that did mathematics. And therefore, he wasn't going to be able to be an astronomer. So his uh, secondary choices were biology and uh, geology. But he wound up doing his first scientific paper in geology. This is a, a, a little sort of more like a newsletter, but actually uh, they treated it as their journal in Albion College. And you can see this issue from 1904. The very first article is a glacial river channel. And it's by J. Harlan Bretz. He puts the period after J here. Uh, and of course, through much of the rest of his uh, career, uh, he wouldn't let people put uh, the periods after his name. Here's the article. Uh, he talks about this, uh, it's a, a glacial river channel. Not very much in, in it, but descriptive. And uh, this is just an undergraduate in, um, in college. So after this, as I said, he uh, became a teacher and he was, became fascinated with the area around Puget Sound. He was a leader of uh, Boy Scouts, and he took them on long hikes. Uh, he became well known for this. In fact, uh, he was uh, written up in the Seattle newspaper quite a lot for the hikes they did all around Puget Sound. And he was, would visit the University of Washington and talk to faculty there who uh, encouraged him to write things up. And so he described features such as the glacial erratic down in the lower right. And he recognized the evidence for the great Puget lobe of the Cordilleran ice sheet that had come down into uh, Puget Sound and had created much of the topography. Of course, the, the images I'm showing here are modern ones where the uh, digital topography has been enhanced and it shows the streamlined shapes, the drumlinoid forms that were created by the ice flow as it came into the northwestern part of Washington between the Olympic Mountains and the Cascade Mountains. But Bretz, over the years he was in uh, Washington, uh, started mapping these features during the hiking he was doing. And 
he was encouraged to uh, go to graduate school to uh, to deal with this. So he decided to go to the best graduate school he could go to, which was University of Chicago. At University of Chicago, the chair of the department was arguably the most famous geologist in the United States at that time, Thomas Trowder Chamberlain. Chamberlain was famous for many things. He was a, a pioneer in understanding the issue of climate change and geology. Uh, he was literally born on a glacial moraine. Uh, he, so glacial geology was uh, a big uh, a thing for him. But he was also interested in philosophical issues about geology, and particularly how geologists rely upon hypotheses. And this is, of course, very relevant because Bretz developed one of the most famous hypotheses in all of geology, the catastrophic flooding that created the channeled scab land. Bretz's dissertation was actually uh, supervised by a colleague of, of uh, Chamberlain, Roland Salisbury. And the story is, there are many stories about Bretz, remember, that when uh, Bretz turned in his uh, dissertation, uh, Salisbury looked at the front page and said, the name you have here is J. Harlan Bretz, but that's not your name. Your student record gives your real name. And, it, and his real name was Harley Bretz. And supposedly, uh, Salisbury said, what is this? Why, why do you put the wrong name on your dissertation? And Bretz supposedly said, Harley Bretz doesn't sound like a very sophisticated scientist. I'm going to forever be known as J. Harlan Bretz. So he invented the name. And forever, this was the name he used professionally. Bretz was a very interesting individual. He combined geological insights, tremendous capability as a field scientist with old fashioned stubbornness. That latter quality was very important to the story. So here's Bretz about this time that we're now talking about, about the time when he was uh, working in the field in the Puget Sound area. But also around this time, I think it was about 1912, a topographic map came published for it was called the Quincy Quad. It's a piece of it is shown on the right here. And on this map was a place called the Potholes. We now know this is a catastrophic flood cataract system. But it, Brett's immediately recognized it looked like a giant waterfall because the cliffs are 150 meters high. Uh, the Columbia River is, is uh, at a much lower level, and there's a, uh, a area, of a big basin, the Quincy Basin, that lies immediately upstream. No river, uh, no, no river at all in the whole uh, area upstream. So this is what we call an anomaly. It, it's puzzling. What, what could have brought this about? Supposedly, Bretz went to his University of College, uh, Washington people and said, look, uh, showed this to them and said, what do you think of this? And they apparently told him, oh, that's nothing. We don't know what that is. It's not worth studying. And Bretz, uh, being the kind of ornery character he was, didn't think much of that. And that was among the reasons why he left to go to uh, Chicago. At Chicago, uh, Bretz was given the responsibility for teaching the field classes uh, for advanced graduate students. As I said, he was very much into uh, lots of uh, rigorous field work, which he had done uh, for years preparing for his dissertation. So here are some of his uh, students uh, in the, at the top. You see them uh, in Eastern Washington. Uh, at the bottom, uh, here they are with their Smokey the Bear hats. Uh, uh, their pipes, just like Brett's on the left, 
they're, they're mimicking him. And uh, this cabin was probably near Spokane because he had uh, uh, friends in Spokane that uh, allowed him to rent the Model T Ford that's shown in the background. Uh, a lot of his trips were uh, done by taking the train from Chicago to Spokane. Uh, initially, though, he worked in, uh, out of Portland and was working in the uh, Columbia Gorge. He didn't get into the channeled scab land proper until the early 20s. Uh, when he was working in the Columbia Gorge area, the thing that really fascinated him were the ice rafted erratics. Of course, he had seen large erratics in the Puget Lowland. Uh, this is one of the bigger ones that is uh, in the Pasco Basin region. Actually, this is in a place called Badger Cooley. And uh, it's uh, typical in that it's, a, this one is a granodiorite. Uh, the rocks are exotic relative to the uh, predominant Columbia River basalt lithologies or the Palouse Luss uh, on which this particular one sits. So the issue is uh, how these got here, and it was generally uh, viewed that they had to be floated in on ice. So in the first scientific publication that Bretz did in a major journal, which he did for Journal of Geology, published out of uh, University of Chicago, edited by uh, T.C. Chamberlain, published in uh, 1919, he mapped out the regions where the evidence showed that these erratics had accumulated up to the high water mark. And so here you can see the outline of the uh, Willamette Valley. Uh, you can see the Umatilla Basin, the Pasco Basin, the Quincy Basin, and uh, all the area uh, for Brett's felt had been inundated. But he thought it was inundated by marine submergence. The idea wasn't completely crazy because they knew that uh, glacial uh, ice would depress the crust and that at the, uh, after the uh, ice age when sea level was lower, there was a large transgression of the sea in the uh, late ice age into the what we now call the Holocene period, and that that put uh, uh, water uh, into uh, the land areas. Now, Bretz himself told me uh, that this is the one paper that he wished he could erase forever from uh, anyone ever seeing it, because it was so wrong. But it's a good illustration that we can have hypotheses that just don't work out. And Bretz very quickly came to realize that the source of the water was not the ocean. It was coming from upstream. By the way, this is a uh, computer simulation of a Missoula flood flow that was done by one of my recent PhD students. And the actual inundation by the flood water, you can see the pattern. Here's the Pasco Basin, Umatilla Basin, the, um, the Willamette Valley. Uh, it basically is the same pattern. It fit, it, but Bretz didn't have the topography. He recognized the, the features very well, mapped them out. But of course, the source was very different. So Bretz revisited this anomaly that he had seen, and here's a modern uh, oblique photograph of the potholes cataract system. And this anomaly triggered his thinking to look for other things in the region, look for what might make this explicable to see what in the natural world would come together to show him how this thing came about. In doing this, he was following a method of geology that had been described by some of the greatest geologists of all time. Uh, in a presidential address uh, just 
a decade or, or two before Bretz's work, Grove Carl Gilbert had pointed out that we geologists are investigators. We're not theorists. And we look at the facts that are unknown and particularly look at odd things. Here's uh, Gilbert next to a very odd thing in the uh, Sierra Nevada. And we try to make a hypothesis. It's a kind of guess, but it's an educated guess. And then we look to uh, see what consequences follow from that hypothesis. So in going out to do his field work in Eastern Washington in the 1920s, Bretz joined by students. Here, Bretz has his old uh, Dodge uh, enclosed car and the grad students are uh, in the Model T Ford. Uh, here's Bretz uh, looking unhappy and you know the grad students are fixing the tire. Uh, he described these features in Eastern Washington which the local people called scab land. So here is uh, what Bratz came to call uh, Butte and Basin scab land. You can see from the, uh, the uh, dirt roads that these things are on an immense scale. They're not like pot little potholes in rivers. They, these are hundreds of meters across, tens of meters deep. Also in the uh, the Lus, the Aeolian emplaced silt up to many tens of meters thick, you had uh, eroded scarps that uh, <coughs> were emplaced by the flood water. Bretts used to go out with a kitchen colander and sift the surface material, and he would get fragments of granodiorite, uh, belt rock from Idaho, uh, all uh, suspended load that had been in the catastrophic flood water that had uh, swept those places clean. He also recognized uh, giant accumulations of gravels, which he uh, which had rounded shapes that he uh, interpreted as immense gravel bars. So here's a cross section. Here's another one of these uh, streamlined hills in the Palouse Luss. He recognized that on the uh, upland divides that the water had actually filled valleys, spilled across divides. In other words, there were pre-existing river valleys that were too small to carry the flood water. The flood water was greater than the pre-existing river valleys. So this is all fitting together in a pattern that is consistent. The scab land was indicating erosion by very high velocity water. So all of this, uh, as I said, fit together. Here is uh, one of the uh, coolies, dry valleys. Uh, this one, Moses Cooley, actually has uh, hanging valleys, uh, cut off uh, spurs between the valleys that were not produced by glaciation, but had to be produced because this was further uh, beyond the glacial margin. This had to be produced by immense flows of water, so much water that valleys uh, would fill up and actually spill out into the next, uh, into the next place. So going back to the descriptions uh, that Gilbert made about how geologists look at things, their hypotheses do not come from theory. As Gilbert said, geologists aren't so much theorists. They, they ultimately get to theories, but really they are inspired by the direct study of nature itself. And they use analogical reasoning to develop tentative explanations but those explanations are founded upon reality. So Gilbert envisioned the geologist just as, as Bretz was, as a field investigator, skilled in looking for hypotheses that were fruitful, not necessarily immediately true, but fruitful in that they led to the discovery of other things. And that discovery in essence told the investigator that they were on the right path, that they had a scent of truth to which they could follow. 
These weren't uh, Gilbert's exact words, but they're similar. Okay, so what happened? In his first field season, Bretz developed a paper published in the Geological Society of America. It was published in 1923. That paper was completely descriptive. It described some of the things I just mentioned without giving an explanation at all. It was readily accepted. Uh, everyone realized Bretz was a good describer of the field evidence. The same year, but actually because the other paper took a long time to uh, get uh, published, another paper came out that ascribed this to catastrophic flooding. What happened in between? Well, several things happened that are very important to the story. One was that the editor, one of the editorial board members of the Journal of Geology resigned and Bretz was put on the editorial board of the journal. Second thing that happened was Bretz got tenure, meaning that if he had got in trouble for something, they couldn't fire him. And that was the point at which he published the paper claiming that this was something that you had to watch out for because there were these old debates between people who thought that landscapes on the planet had developed by catastrophic flooding and those that recognized that there was some process more similar to what's operating today that would produce those features. Bretz knew this was gonna be controversial, but he knew that his field evidence was pointing towards some kind of catastrophic flooding of water. So Bretz continued to, uh, to think about this. Uh, in his 1925 paper, he published a map of pretty much the same area that he would had those erratics from, but in this case, he sh showed it was catastrophic flooding coming from the margin area of the Cordilleran Ice Sheet. And again, here's my students' uh, a water depth map from a computer modeling. You see that a very important uh, element of this is, is a nozzle that separates the Pasco Basin from the lower part of the Columbia, the Umatilla Basin and the Columbia Gorge. This nozzle constricted the water as shown here in the illustration. It's called Wallula Gap. Mm -hmm. And Bretz, who didn't do mathematics, remember, had a colleague of his do a calculation of the discharge. And what they got was 20 million cubic meters per second, which was immensely greater than anything that the Columbia River does, uh, any greater than any world river. So that was a catastrophe. By the way, our modern calculation of the same area is 10 million. Brett Scott, uh, actually his colleague, uh, didn't have the, uh, the the computer models and it didn't have the understanding of the gradient that we now know. So uh, many of the publications that have done now converge about, on, for this place, about 10 million cubic meters per second. Although the inflow out of Glacial Lake Missoula was as much as double that amount. So Bretz uh, continued to uh, describe these features in the field. Here's one of the giant gravel bars. You can see from the road and the building, this thing is about uh, one and a half, two kilometers long. Here are these, uh, the, this Butte Basin scab land again. Here is, are some of the boulders that are in the gravel bars. This one, you can see from the rock hammer, it's about uh, a meter in diameter, it's two meters long. If you look on the edges, this is a uh, hexagonal uh, column of basalt an entire column of basalt with smooth faces on it that was carried in suspension, but it has percussion marks. So this uh, uh, two meter long uh, basalt boulder was actually banging into other boulders in suspension as it was being carried by the flood water. Uh, now, people thought this was mechanically impossible for rivers, but it turns out, and partly based on my own work, 
that this is actually the way the physics should work, but they didn't realize that at the time. Of course, here is the Dry Falls cataract. So this was becoming uh, very problematic, even though Bretz was actually following the appropriate principles that Gilbert had laid out for an investigator. He was looking at the diverse elements and the relationship of the features, how they fit into a whole system, what we call coherence. And he was looking for consistency of all the evidence for the causative hypothesis, that it didn't uh, contradict any known physical principles, but that it showed relationships in time and space that one could map out and would be consistent with all of the other features in the field. The problem though for Bretz was that geologists had thought that to be scientific, they needed a fundamental principle upon which they could use to reason about the unknown past. And this is, has to do partly with a kind of inferiority that geologists have. They have looked to scientists like Isaac Newton as having incredible skills mathematically to predict the future of interactions like planets in orbits around our, the sun in our solar system, but now we know there are other solar systems. And Newton had fundamental principles that he used so that he could apply his mathematics. And one of those is that we, uh, we, we observe the processes that are operating today. We know them because we observe them. And we observe that the principles that apply to them uh, apply all over the universe. So uh, James Hutton, who along with Charles Lyell are considered the premier founders of geology, and the, the, these people have been argued this way by certain historians, developed a principle that was supposed to apply to the whole science that came to be known as uniformitarianism. Neither of these guys invented this word. That word was actually invented by another person who was brilliant, but rarely gets mentioned. We'll come back to him later. But this uniformitarianism idea, which had to do with sort of privileging our observation of the present in regard to the past, was enshrined by Charles Lyell, who had the advantage of a uh, college uh, education in legal practice and logic, so that he could uh, be very skilled at rhetoric. And uh, Lyell, modeling uh, a book on geology on Newton's Principia Mathematica, Principles of Mathematics, published possibly the most famous textbook in geology, the principles of, of, uh, of geology uh, for decades, starting in around the uh, early 1800s. This was the Bible for many geologists the world over. To do geology properly, uh, Lyell argued that one had to have true causes, that we should not put on the past uh, kinds of processes that we do not see acting today. And we should therefore not infer that the energy levels of those processes are not what we can see in operation today. Th th this actually principle came from Isaac Newton. So Bretz was perceived as violating something fundamental. And this led to uh, a very famous meeting in the Cosmos Club uh, in Washington, uh, D.C., largely with scientists from uh, the, the capital and many from the United States Geological Survey, where Bretz was invited to give a talk, kind of like 
I'm giving a talk here to the Geological Society of the Oregon country. And, uh, but uh, unbeknownst to Bretts, there were a whole bunch of people ready to tell him exactly why he was wrong. So uh, you can all get ready to do the same thing with me. Uh, but anyway, uh, what happened was there was a series of people, six, seven, eight. Uh, they were led by W.C. Alden, who was a uh, major force in the United States Geological Survey. And they all went right to the heart of Bretz's problem, that this big flood that Bretz had called the Spokane flood, he didn't really know what caused it. Where, where did the water come from? And Alden points out, in no way it could come from the ice margin. You can't melt the water that fast. The, this, uh, the people observing and critical included very famous people. James Galuli uh, subsequently became very famous. This was when he was a young guy. Uh, uh, Kirk Bryan, another very famous uh, geologist, was in the audience. Uh, O.E. Meinzer, who was uh, headed and became the major chief hydrologist of the geological survey. All these people uh, argued different things than Bretz. In fact, afterwards, uh, Bretz's daughter, uh, Rhoda Riley, uh, recalls, and this is in John Sinekson's uh, uh, book on uh, Bretz's flood, where he talks about uh, interviewing Rhoda. Uh, Bretz was, was uh, depressed for a time. But Bretz was never oppressed for a long time. He eventually, uh, eventually came around, and we'll talk about that. Uh, because there were, although the, the, there seemed to be this huge number of people that uh, were against him, there also were people that were supportive. One of the people that was supportive was Ira Allison, who was a professor at the uh, Oregon State University. Uh, now, or it was then Oregon State College. And he, of course, had studied the Willamette Valley. He had studied the same ice rafted erratics. He was a good field geologist. And he recognized that the things Brett's described were there. The high gravel deposits, the diversion channels, all of these, the scab land, it was all there. And, but Ira was, he felt there had to be an explanation that was not quite so catastrophic. So he thought that the inundation, kind of like the marine inundation that had been talked about, just had a different cause. And that he thought that be, there was <clears throat> so much ice that it had jammed in constrictions and the water had been uh, ponded back. So Allison makes some very good observations. He was. Uh, very interested in the banded silts, which uh, in the eastern Washington came to be called the Tushi beds because of near Tushi, Washington. Uh, and he uh, described these in areas like Alkali Canyon in the eastern part of the Columbia Gorge. The association with ice rafted erratics here near, near Arlington, Oregon, and the fact that these silts contained uh, these ice rafted erratics showed they were emplaced by the floodwaters, but the silts to him meant the flood water was ponded. And indeed we know it was, but he thought the ponding was because ice had uh, uh, jammed up in constrictions. So here's a map of the elevations of the ice rafted erratics. Another reason Bretz was able to feel good was probably the most famous geomorphologist of the day, William Morris Davis, was supportive. It turns out that William Morris Davis had published a paper in 1926 uh, based on a lecture he gave at uh, University of California, Berkeley, on why outrageous geological hypotheses are valuable. And it's an interesting coincidence that when Davis gave this paper, he was actually a professor at the University of Arizona. Here he is on a picnic in Tucson because he had retired early from Harvard University where he had made much of his reputation. 
and he had taken a succession of jobs at various universities around the country. He, was, he had been at Caltech, he had been at University of Texas, uh, but he was at University of Arizona for four years, including the time when he gave this paper. So what, uh, what uh, D Davis pointed out was that the outrageous hypothesis, it's okay if it violates theories, but as long as it's consistent with the observations, particularly anomalous facts, exactly what Bretz was doing. What isn't okay is if you ignore the facts and you present your speculation as a startling theory. It's okay as long as you're still consistent with nature, even if the, th even if the theory is problematic. And what Davis pointed out was something we call pragmatism, that the reality of this thing is not so much what the claim is, but it is the consequences you have of taking it seriously and seeing what it leads to. If it leads to unproductive things, then it's not it's not going to be useful. But if it leads to new discoveries, you know you have something good. But the one thing you can't do is say it's absurd and impossible. The reason you can't do that is logic is about discovering the truth. And if you say something is impossible, you have already closed out the possibility of any discovery. Now that is a very obvious thing to say, but it is violated all the time. And the, the uh, uniformitarianism, which says that you're only supposed to study the processes operating today, does that. In other words, it is a logical fallacy. So why do people not pose these outrageous hypotheses? One is they worry about appearing foolish, that they, are, uh, they don't have a full factual basis. Remember I said Bretz was stubborn. He saw that these things related to one another and he wasn't gonna have people telling him things that were inconsistent with the evidence. There's also problems of publishing your results. We see what Bretz did. He actually was the editor of the journal or on the editorial board, so he got it published. And there's, today, our problem is getting research funding. You, you're not gonna get your research grants if people say you're doing something weird. Well, Bretz didn't have that problem so much because he, his support was uh, from his university for his teaching. So he was basically teaching when he brought people in the field. But there were serious challengers to Bretz. I can't go into all of them, but this fellow was one. This is Richard Foster Flint. Uh, Flint had actually been an undergraduate at University of Chicago when Bretz was a professor there. And there are suspicions that they ran into one another. Certainly, if there were people that could have more diametrically opposed personalities, they would be Richard Foster Flint and J. Harlan Bretz. I once met Flint in an elevator he looked exactly like this picture, except he wasn't looking forward. He was looking down on me because he was very tall. And it was sort of like he was looking at an insect. Uh, I was a very junior faculty member and he was uh, the, the big author of a lot of famous books and the like. And uh, he, uh, he had this manner that was uh, rather, acted rather superior, which must have bothered Bretz uh, immensely. But uh, I once had a chance to talk to one of his former graduate students, a guy who's become very famous now, George Denton, a member of the National Academy. And uh, I asked George uh, what he thought of his advisor, Flint. And he looked at me immediately and said, I totally detested the guy. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, geologists are human beings. Uh, they have their problems. Uh, Flint uh, came up with a very clever uh, idea that was uh, very popular. 
that tried to explain the catastrophic flooding in terms of a, the operation of normal type rivers, basically uh, proglacial streams. So here's a series of block diagrams and the dot pattern shows the uh, deposition by this little stream of uh, gravel grading in front of uh, ice, which lay to the north of the region to the top of each of the block diagrams. And what Flint envisioned was that downstream, and this is a profile along one of the Scabland tracks called the Cheney Palouse track. It goes from near Spokane, where there was known to be the margin of the Cordilleran ice, down to the Pasco Basin, where you had all these silts that Allison had described. And Tushi named this, uh, they were named the Tushi beds by Flint. Uh, so he assumed that a, uh, a dam had been created by uh, landsliding in the Columbia Gorge. And it had produced a lake that had caused these former uh, Scabland channels to aggrade with gravel. So as they aggrade, well, the, here's a, a Flint's uh, depiction of this lake. Uh, it was, not just uh, the Pasco Basin Lake called Lake Lewis, but another one uh, that subsequently has become called Lake Condon, all generated from in the Columbia Gorge from near where uh, the Bonneville Dam is today. And there are giant landslides that have come off of the uh, north uh, bank of the Columbia River because of the dip slopes on the, on the basalt. Uh, and so he inferred that this was the cause of the aggradation. So here's a close up of the block diagrams. And when the dams uh, failed in the Columbia Gorge, then the subsequent rivers incised and removed this gravel, leaving remnants as river terraces and uh, somewhat streamlined hills that uh, looked like gravel bars, but Flint thought they really weren't gravel bars. So all of this to Flint was uh, leisurely streams of normal discharge, aggrading, then degrading, and emptying into standing water in the Pasco Basin. Now, there was a grad student at Yale when Flint published this. Uh, he got his PhD in 1930. His name was Aaron Waters. He was a petrologist interested in igneous rocks. So he was studying with another professor. But Aaron Waters was born on the Waterville Plateau. He had done his early geological thinking about the region. So he knew what Bretz was talking about. And Waters uh, told me in a letter when I was uh, developing the uh, argument for Bretz to get the Penrose Medal of the Geological Society of America, that he had told uh, Flint to go to the Babcock Ridge, which you see in the center of the picture here, and look across the river in the early morning. Uh, the, the, this is not the Columbia, this is a lake. The, the Columbia was a bit smaller. But if you look across to that surface, which Flint would have had as a terrace, what you would see on that surface is this. These are large scale gravel dunes. What, uh, Bretts and uh, others called giant current ripples. They are about 100 meters in spacing and up to 15 meters high. You can see from the uh, grain storage uh, features here how big these are. Uh, and they have boulders on them up to uh, a couple of meters in diameter. They're all coarse and they're all produced by high velocity floodwater flows. Allison immediately recognized Flint's fill hypothesis was hogwash, that uh, it, uh, it misinterpreted the Tushi beds, it didn't de properly describe the gravel deposits, uh, it didn't look at the whole region. In fact, Allison in his paper says, you need an explanation that is consistent, that applies to the whole region. You don't just look at one place and think you've got this cute idea that explains that. Nature is a whole and you have to think of the whole. And that's very critical to being an investigator, which Bretz did instinctively. Now, 
many of you probably know that the tide on the uh, controversy came to turn with this person here, a guy named Joseph Thomas Pardee, who actually had been at the 1927 meeting and made a little critical comment. But Pardee had been studying in the western part of Montana the evidence for an immense glacial lake that he called Glacial Lake Missoula. For Missoula, Montana, shown in the upper right, where there are strand lines of this lake. This is uh, uh, a mountain where the Clark Fork River uh, comes into the basin of Missoula. And you can, these strand lines uh, show that this lake uh, was up to about uh, 800 meters deep, uh, 2,000 feet deep, and was held in by an ice dam in northern Idaho. But the thing uh, that Pardee uh, had originally described at a GSA meeting in 1940 was that this lake had emptied catastrophically. In a paper that didn't get published until 1942, he described these uh, uh, immense gravel bars. And here's one, uh, these are called eddy bars. You can see from the ponderosa pines that these are really high. They block the uh, tributary valleys. They were emplaced by suspended gravel and boulders, multimeter diameter boulders. Uh, the, there are the silts in the foreground that formed by later formations of Glacial Lake Missoula. He described this orally in a uh, very, uh, uh, very carefully worded abstract that had nothing about catastrophic flooding in it, but described the features. And he did not publish this paper until he had in his hands his official retirement papers from the United States Geological Survey. He, put, he sent his manuscript to GSA at that point. His superior at the USGS was that same Alden W.C. Alden, who was so critical of the catastrophic flood hypothesis. There's more to the Pardee story, but uh, that's actually too long to tell at this point. But what B Pardee recognized was a geometry that didn't have the Scabland channels coming from the ice margin directly, but from this immense lake in northern, uh, it, 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 north, uh, western Montana, that was not so large an area, but very deep. The depth of the lake, it generates the energy for uh, producing such an, uh, an immense catastrophic flood. It's held in by a lobe of the Cordilleran ice sheet. There's other complexities because there was another big lake that was held in by another ice sheet here, uh, Glacial Lake Columbia. But the sourcing uh, has been related largely, but not necessarily completely to these ice dam glacial lakes. So what Pardee described in this paper, and here's, here's a diagram from his paper, here's a photo I took in Camas Prairie, Montana, of these immense, uh, what he called giant current ripples. You can see he's got a scale here. Actually, many of them are much bigger than this one, up to 100 meters in spacing. Uh, immense uh, gravel uh, bars that formed uh, downstream of constrictions, all of these things associated with the catastrophic flooding. So uh, Bretz, who was retired uh, by the uh, mid 1940s, uh, went back to the field. Uh, he was joined by H.D.U. Uh, Smith, who acted kind of as a skeptic and then aided by George Neff of the Bureau of Reclamation with new data in the 1950s. They showed uh, much more detailed maps of the Scabland bars. They showed these uh, immense gravel dunes, uh, an incredible huge paper uh, point by point refuting everything in Flint's paper and everything anyone else said, a real uh, you know, masterpiece of answering all critics. Uh, people didn't read this for a while, but by the early 1960s, it was pretty clear 
that the catastrophic flooding hypothesis of Bretz was uh, the appropriate thing in the field. Bretz himself uh, turned to different things. Uh, he started studying, among other things, uh, the origin of limestone caves, published a big book on the caves of Missouri. Here he uh, is, is kind of his favorite pose in retirement. He had this uh, metal hat he wore caving. And uh, he, here's his dog. He did caving with his dog, Larry. Uh, his book on caves of Missouri. Uh, he had to have an outrageous hypothesis for caves as well. He, he was arguing uh, in, kind of in support of William Morris Davis, a argument of uh, uh, the uh, effects of groundwater in regard to the origin of limestone caves. So here are some of his other retirement pictures. Here's Larry, here's Bretz with his hat. This is his home in uh, Homewood, Illinois. He actually built this house himself from a Sears Roebuck uh, catalog uh, in the early 1900s when he first started his job at uh, University of uh, Chicago. And that's when I met Bretz uh, in retirement he actually, uh, in the late 60s, I was communicating with him about my dissertation, but I didn't actually go visit him till the later 70s when I was uh, preparing the uh, material for him to get the Penrose Medal. And uh, I was then a professor at uh, University of Texas. In my own work, I looked at some of the quantitative aspects of the uh, catastrophic flooding, uh, how boulders as big as this one uh, on the Afreda fan could be transported by uh, the kinds of energetics that are in these flows. Uh, there's a whole other story talking about that. I want to close by returning to this idea of uniformitarianism. It's, it, it's fascinating that this idea is in the basic geology textbooks. And as I pointed out, it's logically indefensible <laughs> that this idea that we shouldn't do a certain kind of thinking. We do the thinking that nature requires of us. And we, we don't say that there's a kind of thinking we should not do. Some of Lyell's contemporaries thought that uh, this was stupid. Uh, this is a cartoon that was made by one of Lyell's contemporaries, uh, Henry de la Beche, who was the founder of the British Geological Survey. And he, he's actually uh, critical of the Hutton Lyell uh, idea. And he's showing a big uh, U-shaped valley here, it, probably in Scotland. And this woman has her uh, child who is uh, uh, taking a little relief here, and there's a little trickle going down. And uh, his, uh, what he says here, bless the baby for a valley he a made. So here's a uh, modern flow that uh, created this giant valley. Of course, it was later found that something that we couldn't observe in that area today, glaciation, was uh, important in the formation of that valley. But the more fundamental principle was actually uh, stated by the person who invented the word uniformitarianism. His, his, guy, his name was William Hewell. He, he, he was uh, from the English Midlands and the, and the pronunciation is a bit tricky. But what he said was it, it's unphilosophical to assume in advance the causes. You have to figure those out. You have to see what causes explain the facts, not to say in advance you're only supposed to think certain things. And a, a, another uh, American uh, philosopher of science, Charles Peirce, pointed out that there's nothing wrong with having a wrong idea. Bretz had the wrong idea about his uh, submergence. It's just you look at the consequences of that idea. If they don't work out, you then see if another idea fits the facts better. Uh, but if you say in advance something is wrong, if you say offhand it's impossible or absurd, then you are making a mistake because you learn nothing from that. What you need is what Davis said, a contemplation deliberate enough 
to see what consequences would follow. William Morris Davis in that paper in the 1920s said, there was this crazy idea out there from a guy named Alfred Wegener that continents moved, that they actually had been together. Oh, everybody thought that was so crazy. Turns out Davis said, we should take this seriously, see where it goes. It just turns out that gave us plate tectonics ultimately and the most important uh, discovery in all geology. So the final thing I'll, word I'll leave on this is what uh, Charles Peirce said, writing about another famous geologist, James Dwight Dana, who was both a mineralogist and a geologist, that geology requires a lot of special thinking because nature is not communicative to us. It requires a kind of genius to frame the hypothesis, to press nature with question upon question until she is forced to confess us. He, he, what he says is geology is the most difficult of the sciences, barring none. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Great, wonderful. Hey, everybody. thank you. Yay. Okay. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. So uh, I, I expect to be roasted the way Brett's was at his 1927 meeting. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. We haven't heard from the folks yet. So uh, let's, um, you've been muted. So if you would like to ask a question, unmute yourself. And we, we hope that we have lots of questions here. Also, if um, you don't feel like asking one, uh, type one in the chat box and I'll be watching the chat box and then I'll propose the questions. So I have a, I have a question. Yeah. Are there any outrageous theories now that you contemplate or that are in the in the offing uh, that uh, this sort of perspective opens up to contemplate? There are many. Uh, part of what I do is planetary geology. Planetary science is filled with all kinds of outrageous ideas. The biggest flood channels we know about in the universe are on the planet Mars. Those floods appear to have come from underground. How did that come about? That is an incredible analogy. Mars, uh, men, many of you may have seen the movie, The Martian. It is not a very friendly place. It's very dry. Uh, the atmosphere is very thin, but in its past, Mars had running rivers, it had huge lakes, it had a ocean on the northern plains. How did that happen? There, uh, I published a paper by outrageous hypothesis that the oceans form episodically, and people are still arguing about that one. Um, so this kind of thinking that Brett exemplified uh, is uh, important. It's not that well understood because the emphasis in how geologists think is different than the emphasis in how physicists think. And much of what is written on philosophy of science is written by people who study physics and not geology. So I, I have been very interested in this in part because of my work on the Scabland problem and the controversy. And what I found is that much of what you read in philosophy of science books is completely wrong in regard to geology. It is misleading and almost worthless. But it is useful to read because when people start saying to geologists, well, you don't really understand what's going on, you have a great defense against them because you can see what's wrong with the kind of arguments that they're making. 
philosophers are lar what they largely do is is argue with one another. <laughs> And What's the because, difference yeah. between the subject matter of physics or astronomy, perhaps, and, and geology? It's not just the, the subject matter, uh, because geologists can study the same things. But physicists, uh, it's, it's, it's like they do all their thinking top down and geologists do their thinking bottom up. Another way of saying is they're thinking uh, right brain and geologists are thinking left brain. Uh, what teaching as a planetary scientist, I, I taught classes that are largely physicists. And the physicists can't figure out when you show an image whether the craters are, are uh, holes or whether they are uh, m mountains. They, they can't think of things uh, spatially like that. They think of things analytically in terms of the equations you write for them, but they don't they're incapable of, of doing that. Now, uh, in uh, working with graduate students, it, I find that it is possible to teach geologists enough physics to get by, but take a physicist in the field and they are totally worthless in understanding anything. Uh, when I uh, taught at University of Texas, uh, one of my colleagues was uh, always having to deal with the geophysicists and he would, totally destroy them in exams, not by asking them of the equations. He would give them a complicated sedimentary rock and ask them to describe that rock and tell things about how it came about. And they would melt in total ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's great. <laughs> great to know. <laughs> Encouraging. Anybody else? Uh, got a, a few, yeah. Hi, Scott. You have a question? Unmute yourself. I'm unmuting you, there you go. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Sheila. I was trying to get into the chat room and somebody sent me a thing and I couldn't do a uh, chat to everybody. But first of all, Vic, absolutely wonderful. I know, Talk to two thumbs up. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, this summer, there was an article that was published about uh, the valleys uh, on Mars being carved by glaciers. Uh, what's your, I, when I read that, I said, I wonder what Vic thinks, now I can ask. Well, I'll, I'll send you my comments because I was asked by two media sources uh, uh, about that article. I wrote about four pages for them. Of course, they, they did a soundbite of one sentence uh, or less than a sentence uh, out of that. Um, it, there's, we, we spent a whole class on it. Uh, in terms of the, the problems with that article. <laughs> it, it, it had a wonderful uh, sort of uh, statistical analysis where the things being compared were apples and oranges and all kinds of stuff that weren't related to one another. Uh, and they, did a, they developed a classification of these unrelated things and came out with uh, conclusions that were very broad, but are suspect because the the basic assumptions that were made in the classification arguments. I mean, that's a simple point. There's, there are many, many, many problems with that paper. <laughs> yeah, they didn't have the, the ages of the features right. They were combining things of totally different ages that were unrelated to one another. Um, so. Thank you very much. One follow-up question, the Cosmos Club, uh, where Brett did the presentation in 1927. What is the Cosmos Club? Was it related to GSA or a, what, a national meeting? What was it? It was a, uh, in the, uh, well, starting in the late 1800s, I think uh, people like uh, John Wesley Powell and, and others uh, in the DC area started a, a gentleman's club that was uh, like, you know, clubs for business people and the like. But this one was focused on, on uh, government scientists. So there were people from the Coast Survey and uh, the Navy uh, th that had scientists and 
but a lot of geologists. Geology was very important in the 1800s. It, it, it later got eclipsed more by physics in the early 1900s, and now, of course, bio, biology, uh, especially biomedical uh, and uh, biochemistry and genetics, they dominate the sciences. Uh, uh, that, that's the preeminent journal. Physicists are all upset about that because they <laughs> don't dominate as, as much anymore. But geology is, uh, but the Cosmos Club still exists, but it, it doesn't have kind of the status that it had at the day when Bretz was uh, being roasted there. Okay. Um, anybody? Uh, okay. Arthur, uh, let me unmute you. I think there. Great, thanks. So that was a wonderful talk, Vic. Thank you so much for that. Um, I was really curious about this uh, distinction you drew between the philosophy of geology and maybe philosophy of physics. And a lot of philosophy of science I've read has actually come from evolutionary biologists. And I'm wondering if you see more of a kinship with their approach to science. I, you know, I understand this as being, you know, sort of an approach to historical science. And was curious about your comments on that. Yeah. It, it... I mean, a, a simple thing is uh, geology is a combination of historical and causal. Uh, William Huell, who was a great philosopher of science, argued that what we should call these sciences is paleoetiological sciences, meaning past causes study of past causes, paleoetiological, okay. to distinguish it from physics, which is the study of causes uh, operable that you could put into an experiment. Now, of course, physicists have now, in the quantum and the relativistic world, the edge of the universe and all of that, uh, they have gotten into areas that are beyond their understanding. I, I, I say that truthfully, because they don't understand them at all. All they have is mathematical expressions for them, which they have absolutely no clue what they mean. The mathematics gives them the result, but there's no understanding connected to it at all. Uh, and these are all problems of space and time, different scales of space and time. So uh, physics has gone off into realms that are kind of outside and some would say they're beyond human understanding completely. So biological uh, is largely in the world of, uh, that is you know, accessible to us. So it, that is similar to the geological. Uh, the, the key thing in the biological is life. Uh, what is life? Well, we don't know. <laughs> we we have uh, this is a this is one of the outrageous uh, areas to, to deal with. Uh, we 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 know we have life as we know life, but we don't really know if there are other kinds of life. What where where does the life end and what is life? Uh, there are uh, things that are thought to maybe relate. Uh, the whole realm of the kinds of realities that are dealt with by biology and geology. And uh, those are being studied by a minority of, uh, of people. Uh, and they get into metaphysics, which is the area that is most problematic in philosophy. What is the nature of reality? Uh, at geologist, uh, typically avoid this. Geologists function very well by following the examples of their mentors and other geologists. They are able to do their geological things without thinking much about it. But the re result of that is that the very sophisticated things that geologists do haven't been described a lot. Biologists, partly because of their numbers and, and uh, the, the uh, amount that they can devote to it, have devoted much more to developing a philosophy of biology. So there is a lot in philosophy of biology, some of which I think is applicable to geology. Certainly, 
some uh, biologists like uh, Stephen Jay Gould, for example, uh, were uh, relatively attuned to geological thinking, but not completely. Um, Do you have any suggestions for the amateur, for those of us who aren't uh, professional scientists, as far as how we can think about our explorations? Well, common sense is a wonderful tool for getting involved in the natural world. And uh, the world itself is the best teacher. Ultimately, that's what geologists come to. Now, the ancient Greeks knew this uh, uh, in Plato's uh, uh, dialogues. He actually has an example where Socrates uh, elicits from a child uh, the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, the idea is that the tr what was called truth actually exists already in the natural world and it is we who are uncovering it so that means that everybody has access to the truth and the most important thing is not that they have sophisticated tools or mass spectrometers or telescopes or whatever but they are open to what nature reveals and that they have the sense of wonder to explore that and to think about that. Ultimately, if that leads them to develop tools to explore it more, then they, uh, they, be, they transition from amateur to, uh, to uh, professional. But that curiosity is the key. You know, this, this is critical to our education system. Our education system basically creates 98% uh, science haters and, and there are 2% that are, you know, going to get through the system and love science. Uh, and it's, it's totally antithetical to geology. I mean, there could not be a worse system for having people get interested in geology because every little kid loves to pick up rocks. They, they love all of the stuff around them and it's killed in the school. It just destroyed. Uh, you know, I, I picked up rocks when I was two years old. I always told people I wanted to be a geologist. I guess I'm stubborn like Brett's. I just never gave up. Of course, I couldn't figure out what kind of geologist I wanted to be. I, you know, it, it was, I went through dinosaurs, minerals, plate tectonics, the whole bit. Uh, you know, catastrophic floods found me, not the other way around. Thank you. That's great. Anybody else? Wes? Uh, I'll unmute you, Wes. Okay. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I never thought I would have anything in common with Jay Harlan and Brett, uh, such a brilliant man, but uh, I guess we both uh, started out thinking we were going to be missionaries. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I was, and I gave that up. And almost to the year that I gave up my religion, I became fascinated with geology. I mean, everybody in GSOC probably knows this already, but I'm a total layman. And when so, and my 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 question is about the kind of when somebody asks, "Are there any major things to discover?" You you immediately uh, got on a spaceship and went to Mars. But back here on Earth. Um, it seems like most of the major Earth geological processes have, have been like, like, the, like the Ice Age floods, like the massive flood basalts in Siberia and, and uh, India and, and the Columbia Plateau um, and plate tectonics and continental drift have been um, suggested and, and verified and, and so forth. But in this, in this modern day, do you think there's any any kind of earth-based geological things, puzzles still to be solved? Oh, lots of them. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> they, just in uh, recent years, uh, all sorts of crazy things have been found. Uh, you know, J. Harlan Bretz once uh, said that uh, people shouldn't worry about his uh, uh, channeled scab land flooding because it was so unique 
that it probably never happened anywhere else, that uh, it didn't have to interfere with uniformitarianism. Well, there's now a whole science of mega floods. Uh, the, the reason mega floods were not uh, recognized in the bastions of geology, France and Germany and England, was that the biggest Pleistocene mega floods in that area were the ones that went through the what's now the English Channel, and they're underwater. And the when the secret, you know, Cold War secret uh, data on the morphology of the floor of the English Channel was revealed less, just over ten years ago, it's a channeled scabland landscape. It was produced by catastrophic flooding. And we didn't know until uh, Sanjeev Gupta and his uh, colleagues at uh, Imperial College London actually got the secret data. They had to get, go to France and Belgium and you know, all over to get it. And so they know their catastrophic floods. The, uh, the catastrophic floods I worked on in uh, Central Asia, the, uh, the, the Soviet Union people were you know, they, they were, you know, thinking they were all glacial. They thought the giant current ripples were uh, uh, Rogan moraines. And, you know, they had all kinds of stuff. But it's all catastrophic flooding. Uh, the, uh, my favorite one is in South America, the Patagonian ice sheet, because the big catastrophic floods were on the Baker River. Uh, that, that one uh, you know, completely surprised me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so there's, there's a whole science of that. Um, uh, I, I have always uh, tried to study stuff that uh, no one else was working on because they thought it was a bit crazy. And I have to stop with catastrophic floods now because there's a whole lot of people that are studying it. And, I, and w one reason that takes me to planetary areas is that uh, there's just so much and the, the planets have the potential to teach us about Earth. Uh, the, the Earth has a four and a half billion year history. The first billion years, we know almost nothing about because there are no rocks. Uh, but that is important to understand the Earth. Well, on, uh, on Mars, we have rocks from that, old, that age. In fact, we have Martian rocks that we can study from that because they came to the earth as meteorites. So they are telling us about conditions that relate to the early earth. The whole uh, uh, snowball earth uh, understanding has been generated within the relatively recent time. The earth had these big snowball uh, phases where the earth basically changed into a Mars-like planet, exceedingly cold and dry. And it flipped out of that state because of uh, the Earth's volcanism, which then sent it into a super greenhouse. All of that is uh, relatively recent. All big discoveries, all things that were never quite understood or misunderstood because we didn't look at them properly. So part of this is how we look at things that were thought about one way because people turned their minds off because of silly assumptions like uniformitarianism and didn't think about them creatively enough the way Brett's did about the uh, Channel Scabland problem. Uh, so yeah, uh, <laughs> the worst thing you can do is to say there's nothing more to study <laughs> because then you won't learn anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, Larry, do you want to uh, let me unmute you? Am I unmuted? You're unmuted. We can hear you. I would um, I would just be interested, Vic, in um, the information you're going to send to Scott, your comments about the glaciation on Mars. Could you provide that to all of us? Uh, well, it, it's, it's rather specific to this one paper, which has this uh, big statistical analysis in it. I'm not sure how. Yeah, of course, I can, I can send it. I've got to, uh, if there's somebody I could send it to who would make it available, it, it, it's just, uh, uh, it, it was just something I banged out 
in a few hours because a news guy uh, um, asked me for comments. But yeah, I can uh, I can send it. But there needs to be somebody that can uh, communicate it to everybody. Uh, that would be Paul, right? <laughs> we we have the means to do that. Yes. Yeah, we okay. Can it, uh, we if, can put it on the website if you'd like if, us to. If yeah, if, if you send me an email, then I'll send you this as an attachment. But you should look at it first because it's kind of just related to a specific problem the reporters were asking me about. So, but yeah. so, so the uh, the the paper you're commenting on, you might want to just mention that in your. Well, is it in the comments? Uh, no, uh, it, it, they, uh, re typically what happens, you, you get a, uh, a reporter from a journal or newspaper and, and they'll say this, they, they, they got the news release that this paper has come out. This particular one was, I think, uh, published in Nature Geoscience. And um, it's a technical paper uh, that has a lot of statistical analysis in it. Uh, and uh, then I read the paper and I provide a comment that they will then use in a story that they run about it. As I said, I did about four pages and they took about, you know, 10 words out of it for their comment. That's typically the way these things get uh, noticed. But there were many issues in the paper. And so uh, reading the paper and then the comment would be the way to understand it. So I can, mm -hmm. uh, when uh, Paul sends me, I could, I will put in a copy of the paper and my comment and uh, you can decide whether people want to read it because it is a bit, uh, it gets a bit technical. Well, so when are we going to get you back up here for another uh, we We're, we're going to get him up here for Rhea. We're going to wine and dine him with pizza and beer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I did. Uh, I did a talk for the Geological Society of Oregon Country a number yeah, a of years, years ago. ago. Yeah, it was in a room of about three hundred people, I think, <laughs> and they had they had the wine and dine there uh, in the pizza restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, you know, before the COVID hit, we were filling the we were filling the uh, room fifty three to capacity, so for, we'd be delighted to have you back again and and if you're interested in in and everybody's interested in the philosophical aspects to uh the talk tonight you will also really enjoy when we do get david montgomery to come and talk about his book the rocks don't lie and uh you know we still have that in the works for him to come um he, you know he we had to cancel the banquet um, this year, but uh, he, he is willing to come again, or maybe he would do it on Zoom too. So uh, we have some, some more interesting things coming up too. Um, any other comments here before we wrap up? Okay, uh, I'm seeing Larry over here. I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna unmute you if you wanna say anything. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Sheila, hi, Paul, and everyone else. Um, so I, I loved what you were saying about the idea or the value of the outrageous hypothesis. I think that's awesome. So going back to your, the outrageous hypothesis that Mars flooding may be episodic. If that's the case, is there, is it outrageous that we may simply be in a, you know, extended million year dry phase of that process and that a pro, that a mechanism like the super volcanism you just mentioned might be something that <coughs> that or is that too outrageous? Well the the geological evidence looks like these uh, phases that could shift Mars to a wet condition uh, are probably closely related to volcanism uh, that's in the planet. Mars uh, doesn't have plate tectonics so it's a one plate uh, planet meaning that the internal heat from Mars that's being generated, uh, and this is still an unknown proposition, the, the, uh, in a, a planet with a liquid core and a solid core, the, for, uh, form, the formation of the solid core from the liquid releases heat at the core mantle boundary. And that uh, produces uh, zones of thermally heated 
uh, mantle material that will rise because of lower density called the mantle plume. And it will come up and generate huge amounts of volcanism. The other way the planets can lose heat is by convection, which is kind of like the, what happens in a uh, pot on the stove. You heat the bottom and then the water rises in a current that brings heat to the surface. And, th and that can bring volcanism to the surface. And the last one is conduction, where like in a, you heat a rod and the heat just moves through the rod. But conduction is very inefficient whereas uh, convection is efficient, but Mars uh, doesn't have a uh, moving plates like the Earth. So it seems that it, its heat builds up and releases giant plumes. And the biggest plumes happened early in the history of the planet, four billion years ago. Uh, and with time, there have been plumes, but they've been smaller and smaller and smaller. So if the heat engine is driving the change, then it's running down, which makes sense in terms of uh, Mars uh, cooling off uh, internally uh, and uh, uh, its uh, core becoming completely solid. Unfortunately, there was a mission to measure the uh, character of the core that hasn't been very successful called InSight, which we're trying to use a seismometer to determine whether Mars had a liquid core. Uh, so we don't know, and this this of course makes uh, you know the the hypothesis uh, not uh, fully developed. But that doesn't mean it's wrong to hypothesize about it because you'd learn nothing unless you try to do it. Right. Okay. Thank Great. you. Wonderful. Um, well, I I could be up all night here talking <laughs> about this. Um, but I will wrap it up here unless anybody else wants to stay on. Um, and Dr. Baker, I would encourage you to look at some of the chat. If you haven't, there's been some good comments and I'll just have you read them if you want to. And uh, thank you okay. folks for being here. Wonderful to see everybody. Yeah, Carrie, good to see you. Glad you're with us. Okay, thank you. Okay. And stay safe you, from fire and the virus as well. I, I mean, everybody needs to be careful. Uh, uh, I certainly am trying to be careful in my life as well. Well, we're going to be looking forward to a new year next year and hopefully a normal year. And we'd love to have you back in person. Okay. Thank